All right, I love that. Turn back with me, if you would, to Galatians chapter 5, uh, as we are continuing to look at the fruit of the Spirit today. Uh, and today we're talking about the idea of peace or having peace. And you know, when you look in God's Word and you see the Old Testament and New Testament, you will see both in the Old Testament and the New Testament a fully developed, shaped word called peace. But it wasn't always that way, really. Let me give you a little history uh, of the idea of peace. In the Old Testament, the Hebrews uh, had the word shalom. You've heard the word shalom, right? That means peace. It was absolutely a fully uh, developed word, multidimensional. Shalom could mean hello. It could mean goodbye. It could mean peace, prosperity, health. It could mean the absence of war. It could mean having peace, shalom, in the presence of war. It could have all of those. Now, if you go to the New Testament, as you journey through uh, the Hebrew Old Testament and into uh, the season where the Greeks took over, during that Greco-Roman time uh, of the New Testament, uh, there was a desperate need for a translation of the Hebrew Old Testament into Greek. Why? Because the children of Israel had disobeyed God. God had taken his hand of protection off of them. Uh, They were allowed to be scattered uh, all over the place in Babylon and every place else. Then all of a sudden the Greeks show up and Alexander the Great said, we are going to teach anyone and everyone to learn to speak Koine Greek. So in this, what is referred to as intertestamental period, that time 400 years before Christ, when Malachi the prophet wrote the last book of the Old Testament, Old Testament, Genesis to Malachi, then the start of Matthew in the New Testament in what is referred to as the intertestamental period. In that time of silence, there was a desperate need for the Hebrew Old Testament Testament to be translated into the Greek. If you want to write down a word for this, that's called the Septuagint. So if you ever get a Bible quiz and someone says, what's the Septuagint? It is what was written three centuries before Christ. It was the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. Here's what happened. There was a word that sounded a little like or seemed a little like peace. And it is a word that you've heard or you've at least known someone. Anybody ever known anyone or at least heard songs about someone named Irene? right? That is the Greek word. When you look at peace in the New Testament, it is that Greek word. And so what happened is the, uh, the translators of the Hebrew Old Testament into the Greek Old Testament called the Septuagint, they begin to look for equivalent words in the Greek vernacular, or Greek vocabulary. They couldn't come up with one. Why? Because shalom was so fully developed. It was multidimensional. It could talk about the highs and the lows of life. Literally, you could show up to someone on their highest mountaintop, their greatest space of success, and say shalom. And it spoke to them because it was so fully developed. You could show up to someone in their deepest, darkest valley, their biggest hurt in life, their uh, most amazing loss in life, and say shalom. There was not an equivalent Greek thought. But there was this word, Irene, which meant for the Greeks and for the Romans one thing. The absence of war. The absence of war. And so what happened is those that were translating the Hebrew Old Testament into the Greek, they took that word, Irene, and they literally stole it from the Greeks. And then they began to develop its meaning. That's why when you look through the New Testament, you see things that will talk about peace in your heart and peace with God and peace of mind. It didn't originally start that way. The Greeks, really, and the Romans... When they used that word Irene, that Greek word Irene, it just meant they weren't at war with anybody at the moment. But can I tell you this? If in your journey, if in your life, you are only going to have peace or I'm only going to have peace in my life when I'm not at war with somebody or there's not some conflict in my life, can I tell you, you are going to lack peace all of your life. How many of you know that? There is never going to be a space in your life and my life where my health is always going to be good, my finances are always going to be good, my, uh, my job's always going to be good, my relationships are always going to be good. Can I tell you, you're never going to have peace if that's what you're waiting for. I was reading an article this week that as they've studied the history of the world, 
They navigated back 3,400 years in the history of our war. Only 8% of all 3,400 years has there been what would be referred to as worldwide peace. That means of the 3,400 years, only about 238, 239 years of that entire 3,400 years, this goes way before when Christ was born, that there was ever what they would refer to in some large way as peace on earth. And can I tell you, that's the way it is in your life and my life. If I think back in my life, probably there have been about 8% of the days in my life or 8% of the weeks in my life or 8% of the years in my life where generally things were good. That I didn't have some sort of conflict with somebody or, or some job difficulty, something going on. So I want us to understand here as we journey through life today, please don't think the pastor is going to sit here and give me four or five thoughts on how to remove all the conflict in my life. I'm not. Trust me, if I could, I would. And I would start with my life. But what I can do is we can hopefully capture that Old Testament meaning of shalom and, and see it in its fully developed, multi-dimensional perspective that deals with my past, my present, and my future that deals with my highs and my lows, that deals with my hellos and my goodbyes, that deals with the conflict in my life, that I can understand how I can be a peacemaker, not just a peacekeeper. And when my peacemaking doesn't work, I learn how to respond in such a way that I can still live with peace. So let's look at Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23, and let's read the passage again and just notice what the idea of what brings us peace. Here's what it says. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. We looked at that. Joy. We looked at that. Peace. Here's this idea. And remember, this is the New Testament word that is being ta that is taken on the Old Testament complexities of peace. Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such thing, there is no law. So when we think about this idea of peace and having peace, please, please, please don't ever think that peace will come when this relationship is fixed. Peace will come when I get a better job. Peace will come in my life when uh, we stop arguing in our marriage. Or don't ever think peace will come when I stop arguing with my teenagers. Can I tell you what, if that is what you are waiting for, good luck, right? And I don't know how you are with kids, but I can think back over those seasons, years when our kids were young, and we had four of them, that here's what would happen for us. We would go through the school year, be crazy busy, and as you get to the end of May, did you, were you like me? I just longed for summer to come. So I could hang out with my kids. Am I the only one that used to do that? I did. I didn't want them to have to wake up. I didn't want to have to work with homework. I really wanted life to be easy on me. Uh, and so I began to think, man, we're going to have so much fun. We're going to go to the lake. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. And that lasted about a month. And then the next month, were you like me? I could not wait for school to start again, right? So there are times in our lives that the things that bring us peace in one season don't bring us peace in the other season. And so, child of God, as we think today on the idea of peace, don't ever think that peace is simply the absence of something. But instead, Jesus and the New Testament writers reflect the Old Testament idea of peace, and they say peace is not the absence of conflict in your life. Peace is not always being good with everybody in your life. Peace is not just having uh, a, a perfect job. Instead, peace is found in a person, and that person is Jesus Christ who brings forgiveness to your past, your present, and your future. Look at John chapter 14, verse 27. Notice what Jesus said. He says this. He says, peace, that's that same word. That's the Greek word that, that Jesus and, and the New Testament writer is given a fuller meaning, letting that Greek word that simply meant the absence of conflict, let it mean way more. So Jesus says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. He says, man, it, it, it's something. Jesus says, man, I want you to understand. I want you to look at my life, Jesus says. 
that there was those seasons of highs and lows, fed 5,000, everybody clapped. There were times they wanted to stone me, they wanted to kill me. Ultimately, those I loved and cared for, the disciples most, one of those betrayed me. The rest of them denied me. I was delivered into the hands of, hands of sinful men, but I was still able to hang on the cross. Jesus said, my peace I leave with you. I was still able to hang on the cross. Let my first words to the Father be, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That's peace. But notice what Jesus said. He says, peace I leave with you. He says, my peace I give to you. The question is, are we willing to receive it today? See, if the only form of peace you will receive today is the idea that I've got to get along with everybody and life's always got to be good and I've always got to be healthy and I've always got to be wealthy, can I tell you, you'll never have peace. But Jesus says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. What was his peace? A peace that went through the battles and still was able to hang on the cross in that worst moment of all, his entire life, and say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Now notice, he, reads, he goes on, he says, I do not give you peace as the world gives you. Jesus is clearly saying, listen, the world is going to promise you peace. And if all you do is look at the world, what the world's answer to peace is, you'll never have peace. I was Googling a lot this week and reading. I always read as I'm prepping. And I ran across this article. You can Google it if you want. Uh, and it says 10, Google it, 10 surprisingly common anxiety triggers that steal your peace. How many of you would like to know what those 10 things are? All right, let me just share them with you real quick. And, and these might help some of you. Uh, everybody say number one. Number one, 10, 10 common uh, issues with still, that still our, uh, our peace. Too much caffeine. All right, how many of you, uh, you drink too much coffee? You can be honest. How many of you are married to someone who drinks way too much coffee, right? <laughs> I love that. You know, there are a lot of times that Gina walked in on Sunday morning. She'll walk into my office. I'm sitting there with a cup of coffee. Her first thing is, uh, what cup is that? Why? Because she says, you really don't need to drink coffee. You're hyper anyway. You don't drink, you need to drink coffee. So number one, everybody say number two. A messy home. Stress calls no peace, man. When your home's a wreck, man. Well, I don't know one of the things Gina just loves is when the house is clean, right? Uh, if you're like me. Guys, how many times a year do you clean your garage? Every decade or so? Don't you ever, do you ever just spend all day out there cleaning, your, cleaning the garage, guys, and say, you know, I'm never going to let it get back to that until the next day when I go, I'm going to let it get back to that. Here's number three. Number three. Everybody say three. three. Self-neglect. You don't take care of yourself physically, spiritually, emotionally. That can destroy your peace. Uh, here's number four. Everybody say four. Uh, not enough sleep. How many of you could use more sleep? All right. Start that during the Cowboys game today. Not now because you're going to miss out on a bunch of good stuff right here, okay? Need more sleep. Uh, everybody say five. Five, too much stress. Man, they say sometimes we just need to simplify our lives. We overcommit. We do this. We do that. Man, too much stress. Still our, still our peace. Here's number six. Everybody say six. Finances. Man, not having a good plan, not having a good budget. Uh, man, struggling with too much debt. Your finances can absolutely steal your peace. Here's number seven. Everybody say seven. Man, going into social gatherings, not knowing anyone. How many of you hate that? All right. How many of you that doesn't bother? That doesn't bother me. Uh, Gina doesn't like it, man. But there are times that if you are not just that social person that just rolls in there and starts asking questions, man, you're going to be freaked out by that. All right, here's number eight. Everybody say eight. A crazy work environment. A crazy, if you are in a crazy work environment, maybe uh, you're in uh, kind of a market, uh, uh, the, an industry that's just going crazy right then, or maybe you have a crazy boss, or maybe you are the crazy boss. Uh, uh, that means you're still in everybody else's peace. Uh, here's number nine. Everybody say nine. Conflict. Conflict, it says, of any kind in your marriage, with your kids, at the office, whatever, with, the, with your neighbors, those in school. Conflict. Everybody say ten. Y'all want to know what 10 is? Remember, we're at 10. 10. This is, by uh, the way, a mental health org organization. Mental health. Uh, it says 10 common triggers for anxiety that steal your peace. It says 10 right there. I go, go Google it. Um, everybody say 10. There's not 10. There's nine. 
They left apparently the most important one off. And I thought, this is exactly what Jesus meant. He says, my peace I leave with you, my peace I give you, not as the world gives you. I wonder, how many of you want to know what 10 is? Yeah, apparently they're good with your mind, but not good with math. That's what I'm saying. But I was like, surely that's wrong. Where's number 10? I began to read the last paragraph. Where's number 10? That's what the world does to us, folks. They will promise us the world and never deliver. All right? Obviously, this was an editing mistake, but I want you to understand, Jesus understood this. Man, he lived in a world where people were being promised all kinds of peace, but the world would not deliver. I love Jesus' words. My peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives. So, child of God, I want you to know, if you are looking for peace, real peace, peace of mind, uh, peace in your heart, uh, peace in your relationships, peace at the job, peace uh, uh, at the office, wherever it is. If you're looking for that and you are only looking to the world, you will miss it because chances are you in your own mind, in your own heart, will go back to a Greco-Roman mindset of what peace is. It is the absence of conflict. And if you are waiting for the absence of all conflict or problems in your life before you have peace, you will live most of your life with no peace and no joy. You say, okay, pastor, then, then what does it mean that Jesus leaves me and gives me his peace? There are three quick thoughts I want to share with you today. Number one is if you're going to have peace, you got to have peace with God. It starts right there. Child of God, Jesus, our Savior, the one who leaves us peace, the one who gives us peace, the one who gives us peace, not as the world gives, which never ultimately fulfills its intended purpose, that we have to have peace with God. But how do we have that through Jesus Christ? Man, I love what Isaiah the prophet said, and we're going to see this here in a couple of weeks. Uh, Isaiah the prophet, 700 years. This was one of the books that was translated in, from Hebrew uh, into, uh, into the Greek in the Septuagint. And, and I want you to know, one of the things that Isaiah does, he uses that word shalom, peace, over and over and over again. But here it is. We will read this around Christmas. But he says, For unto us, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, a child is born, to us a son is given. That's the full humanity and deity of Jesus right there. Humanity and deity right there. 700 years before Christ, there are times that people will say, Well, New Testament writers just made all this up. 700 years before Christ showed up, Isaiah the prophet said, There will be a virgin. She will go with child. It will be a child that is born and a son who is given. Continue to read them. And the government will be on his shoulders. And we say, praise the Lord, thank the Lord. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor. Not one that gives you nine of ten. Not one that gives you four or five. One that gives you everything that you need. He says, a Wonderful Counselor, a Mighty God, an Everlasting Father. And listen to these words. The Prince of Shalom. Here's, here's, the, here's the thought, child of God. As you know, that Greek understanding, that Roman understanding that peace was the absence of war, the Old Testament had the idea that peace, shalom, was multidimensional. It was your hello. It was your goodbye. It was your mountaintop. It was your darkest valley. It was harmony. It was disharmony. It was the idea that you could have shalom regardless of what was going on. You go look at Isaiah's day. It was not a great day. For the children of Israel. But over and over he says, shalom, shalom, shalom. But more importantly, here's what it is. Remember what Jesus said in the New Testament? He says, my peace I give to you. My peace I leave for you. How can he do this? Well, go back to what Isaiah the, said. Isaiah the prophet said. He said what? He said, Jesus is the prince of peace. So if you take all of the ideas, all the wisdom, all the understanding, all the scriptures of what peace really is, guess who peace's prince is? Jesus. That's why Jesus can say, child of God, 
You're going through a marriage difficulty, a hard season in your marriage right now, you can still have peace. That's why Jesus can say, listen, you have family dynamic with a mom and dad or a son or daughter that's hard and there's conflict there. Jesus says, I can still give you shalom. I can give you peace in the midst. Your, your finances falling apart, your career falling apart, your health falling apart. Jesus says, listen, I can still give you peace. Why? Because there's that multidimensional aspect. Jesus says, listen, I am the Prince of Peace. I, I am in charge of all your goodbyes and all your hellos. I can give you peace in every one of your mountaintops and every one of your darkest valleys. Man, when you are in a season of harmony in your marriage or disharmony, God can still bring you peace. Why? Because Jesus is ultimately the Prince of Peace. You say, how then does the Prince of Peace not only give me peace here, but peace with God? Look at what he says in Isaiah 53, just a few chapters later. He says this, he says, But he, Jesus, the Prince of Peace, was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us, what's the word? Come on. The punishment that brought us peace, man, was on him. And by his wounds, we were healed. We all like sheep have gone astray, each has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Man, what an incredible thought. He says, here's how you have peace with God. You understand that God sent the Prince of Peace, that that Prince of Peace showed up in the person of Jesus Christ in a place called Bethlehem to a mom named Mary and a father named Joseph, lived a perfect life that Prince of Peace did, ultimately delivered into the hands of sinful men, nailed on a cross to pay for all of our sins. By his wounds, we were healed, and his peace now rests upon us. Why? Because he gave it to us. He leaves it to us. You say, then how can I have peace today? Well, first of all, you need to understand that the peace of God covers all three tenses. The past, your present, and your future. The past, man, that God, because of your faith, in Jesus Christ, who died, buried, rose again the third day, because of your faith in Him, all of your past mistakes, all of your past sins are forgiven, every one of them, even the ones you can't forget. But not only does His peace bring past forgiveness, it, it brings a present certainty that every one of my two days are taken care of because I am in Christ's hands. But then also my future. You say, Pastor, what does tomorrow hold? I don't know. I don't know what it holds for you. I don't know what it holds for me. But here's what I do know. I know that Jesus holds the future. So that's why we can have, uh, have total peace through Jesus. Man, by His wounds, we were healed and have peace. My past sins, my past mistakes, my past failures have all been forgiven. You know, here's the reality, child of God. If you look back over your past, you probably weren't as good as everybody thought you were in your best moment. How many of you know that? You ever been in one of those seasons, done one of those things that, man, it's just everything turned out right, and everybody looked at you and said, you're awesome, and you're kind of going, that's kind of lucky. Here's the reality. When you look in your past, you probably weren't who you were in your best moment. But can I also tell you this, as a child of God, you also probably weren't who you were in your worst moment. Do you understand that? So don't go drifting back to that addiction, that failure, that mistake all the time and think, man, how did I do that? So I want you to know it's really not what your past best moment was about or past worst moment was about. Jesus would say peace is about what our next moment is going to be about. So, child of God, if I want to have peace, it starts with a peace with God that comes through Jesus Christ, who is the Prince of Peace. Second thought, now that I've made peace with God, and God has forgiven me through Jesus Christ of all my past, my present, and He holds my future as well, you say, I have to do what? Then I have to totally turn around and make peace with my past. You say, what does that mean? Man, if you look in God's Word and just think about what it means to have peace with our path. Let's go back to Isaiah the prophet, the, the prophet of Shalom. Here's what he says in Isaiah 43. He says three things we're going to see there. Forget the former things. 
How do you make peace with your past? Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. He says, instead, see, take note. This is peace. I am doing a new thing, a new thing. I love it. Now it springs up. Here's the question. Do you perceive it? Then he goes on. He says, I'm making a new way in the wilderness and the streams in the wasteland. Man, if you think about those words right there, how do I make peace with my past? Well, here it is. First of all, I look at my past and I realize, uh, man, my past shapes me, but it doesn't define me. Please write that down. Your past does shape you. If you grew up in a broken home or uh, with an abusive father or abusive mom or, or maybe you made some mistakes in your past or you've been through a season of addiction or, or you failed, can I tell you, all of those shape you. But by God's grace, they don't define you. What defines me is that I am a child of God who needed grace. I wasn't good enough to earn God's love, but God gave it to me anyway. And as a result of my faith in Jesus Christ, Jesus left me peace and gave it to me. So thought number one, if you and I are going to make peace with our past, do exactly what Isaiah says. Forget about it. Yes, you'll remember them. But don't let it define you. If all I do is hold on to this, that, man, I did this, or I grew up in this home, you're letting it define you. God doesn't want to let it define you. Yeah, it's going to shape your conversation. It's going to shape who you are. It's going to shape a little bit uh, of what you're about. But don't ever use your past as an excuse for God not to use you tomorrow. Then notice the second thing he says. He says, not only I'm doing a new thing. See, child of God, part of Walking in peace is realizing that God wants to do a new thing in your life. And then he asks the question, he says, do you perceive it? Do you perceive it? Here's what I've perceived, noticed over the years. That there are times that I'll sit with somebody at a coffee or at a lunch or in my office. They'll say, Pastor, can we talk? And they'll just begin to tell me about their journey, and I really want to be used by God. And then they'll start telling me what, else, what all is going on in, your, on their life, in their life. And I'm sitting there going, man, you are telling me a story that it sounds like God is all over you, offering you a new future and a new tomorrow. Do you perceive it? So if you're here today, if you want peace, man, deal with your past. How do we do that? We understand what he said. Isaiah says, man, forget the past. Yeah, it shapes you, but it doesn't define you. But he says, realize God wants to do a new thing. I don't care where you've been or what you've done. Look in God's Word. God's Word is full of men and women who had broken past that God blessed in the future. So do you understand that God wants to do a new thing in your life? And what does it mean, a new thing? Here it is. The next thought, he goes, I am like streams going through your wilderness or your wasteland. He, the imagery for Isaiah is that we are as a nation. That's what he was saying at that point. We are going through this wilderness, this wasteland, this desert. And all of a sudden we come over a hill and we see this stream. God is doing a new thing. And so as I think about forgetting my past, understanding God's going to do a new thing, then I see the streams of God's grace. Here's the point. God wants to take your past and your brokenness, do a new thing, and part of that new thing is by taking your hurts of the old and using them to minister to someone else. You heard us talk the last few minutes uh, today about the release of the cancer ministry and our partnership with Right Now Media because we do it right and we do it the best, and, and they're going to launch it. But here's the key. If you walk over, and I want to encourage you to do so after this, go to our mission wall, talk to the people about cancer ministry. What, do, what will you notice about everyone serving in the cancer ministry? They either had it or their loved one did. What does that mean? They're not, they're not going to let their past physical condition define them. Yes, it shapes them. But what do they understand? I want to forget that. I want to understand God wants to do something new. And then I want God to use that that I've been through cancer to encourage someone else. That is the stream. And so as we think about our lives, that's it. I love what the Apostle Paul says. Boy, in Isaiah chapter 48, Isaiah said, forget the past, look forward to the future. What did Paul say in Philippians chapter 3? I won't read it, but it's in your passage. He says, the one thing I know 
The best thing I can do in life is forget what lies behind, press forward to what lies ahead. Why? He says, because I know that I haven't achieved it yet. Child of God, if you're in a space or a place of brokenness today, you haven't achieved it. But you do need to learn to forget what lies behind, press forward to what lies ahead, because that's where the goal of Christ. Christ wants to take everything you have and everything you've done and everything you've been through. And God will never waste a hurt. He will use your hurt, your heartache, your struggle to minister to someone else. So here's number three. First thing, if I'm going to have peace, it's not just the absence of conflict. It's the presence of way more. It starts with peace with God. Secondly, it happens when I make peace with my past, and now we go to the outward. So there's always this understanding this, this peace has a vertical and now a horizontal relationship. That I want to begin to make peace with others every chance I get. Now notice I use that word chance. There is the possibility, and I'm going to show you one biblical example as we close here in a second. There is the possibility you can do everything right to try to make peace with someone else and it not turn out well. How many of us understand that? Notice what Paul said in Romans chapter 12, verse 18. He says, if it is possible, everybody say possible. That means that he's also saying sometimes it's not possible. However, I want to live, he says, my pattern of life should be one that if it is possible, as far as it depends on you or me, live at, what's that word, peace with everyone. In other words, if I've got to say so, if I've got any input into a relationship, I'm going to live in peace and not conflict with somebody. If I've got that choice, and that's why he says, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. He says, do not take revenge, my dear friends. Well, that seems like no fun. Oh, but leave room for God's wrath. Okay, that's fun. That's just the way my mind thinks. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay. So here's kind of the idea. As I think about doing everything I can to be a peacemaker. I've got peace with God. I've made peace with my past. Now my job is not to be a grouch to everyone I come into contact with. But instead, I want to make peace with others. And you say, why is that so important? Because we do understand that the more peace, uh, peacefully we live and we journey both inside and outside, the more I have peace of mind and peace in my marriage, peace in my relationship, peace with my kids, I'm going to be happier. But spiritually also, I'm going to have spiritual growth. But here's the beautiful thing. I can have peace in the midst of conflict. You say, there are two ways to approach this. He says, as far as it depends on you, be at peace or make peace with everyone. You, you know, there is a difference between peacekeepers and peacemakers. How many of you know that? Peacekeepers, what do they do? That's kind of like a UN. They go and they get right between two warring factions. They don't fix the problem. They just avoid and appease, right? Those are called peacekeepers. I want you to know, if your marriage is struggling, you don't want to be a peacekeeper. You want to be a peacemaker. Man, a peacekeeper is passive. They just constantly let bad things happen. And well, that's not what he's talking about. Jesus, in Matthew chapter 5, at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, he said, blessed are the peacemakers. See, a peacekeeper is passive, avoids doesn't fix anything. A peacemaker steps back and says, I'm going to actively fix this problem. You say, all right, pastor, I've got conflict with somebody. Maybe this will help. You might want to write these down. You say, I'm in conflict with somebody. I, I, my marriage, me and my, my husband and my wife, we're struggling with our kids. And so you say, how do I know when to be a peacemaker? Because I also want you to know the invitation is not for everybody to go out here and be a peacemaker to everything. All right? You don't need a long coffee about everything. You say, how do I know what I should be a peacemaker about? Thought number one, ask yourself this question. Is what happened to me a one-time event, or is it happening over and over again? If, uh, you know, there's ladies, if, if your husband just popped off one time, or, or, or men, your, your wife just snapped at you one time? Or is it an ongoing pattern of, of just talking down and criticizing? Man, if it's an ongoing pattern, 
then I might need to step forward and be a peacemaker to say, listen, this is hurting our relationship for you to continue to talk to me or continue to do. So was it a one-time event or is it happening over and over again? Here's number two. Ask yourself the question. When you are hurt by someone else, and be honest, was it intentional or unintentional? See, see, there are times in our lives that someone will say something or someone do something, and it's not intentionally towards me. It's not personal, but it hurts. So question number two, man, is it something they did intentionally or personally to me? Here's number three. Is it a big deal? Or am I making a mountain out of a molehill? And if you say yes, it's not a one-time deal. It's ongoing, and it keeps happening over and over again. Two, it wasn't accidental. It is personal. Three, it's not little. It is big. Then I need to actively become a peacemaker. And I need to understand as I step forward and try to make peace, I need to be active. But notice this, Proverbs chapter 10, verse 19. It says, sin is not ended by multiplying words, but the prudent hold their tongues. That means when I go to be a peacemaker with someone, if I've got to go have that conversation, the first thing I want to do is not tell the story to the world. Not get everybody on my side and against the other person. All right. Anybody ever been around those people that, you know, they say, boy, you either love them or you hate them. But you ever been around those people that were always putting the people around them in conflict? You either chose their side or the other side. Can I just be the neutral party here? All right. So you want to step forward. And here's what it says. He says, understand the point of being a peacemaker is to get the relationships fixed as quickly as possible. Not to just go on and on and on and on. Just go fix the problem. And so that's what we want to do. I want to be involved in such a way that I minimize the talk, minimize the gossip. Here's a second thought. Don't continue to rehearse the hurt over and over and over and over again. There have been times as a pastor over the years that I'm sitting there talking with somebody, and they'll, they'll say, you know, so-and-so over there, they hurt me. And I go, what happened? Well, they did this. And I'm like, when did this happen? They said, 2017. And I'm like, really? But they're telling the story like it was yesterday. And I'm like, cut them some slack. Right? Stop retelling the story over and over again. Now, listen, if you have been some through, through a major abusive situation, I'm not saying don't spend time with, with a therapist and a counselor. You need that. But I'm talking about gathering other people around. Man, go to them. Don't multiply the words. Here, here's another idea. Don't expect too much. You say, Pastor, did you just say lower my standards? No, I said, lower your expectations because it's probably not going to turn out well. Have you noticed this? Anybody ever had in your mind, you know what? They probably just, I just need to go to them. I'm going to pray. Anybody, has, am I the only one that's ever done? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to them, have the right alert. I'm going to share, do you realize that, that you hurt me? You know, honey or, or sir, did, did you know when you say this, it, it hurts me? And you just kind of have in your mind's eye that they're going to turn around and go, I had no idea. Your feelings are so important to me. And I love you so much. And you go and you have that conversation. And they're like, well, let me tell you what you do. And, and, you know, and you're kind of sitting there going, I didn't, how many of you have been in that season? That you had all these, lower your expectations a little. If we can get to a working resolution where I'm not having to retell the story over and over again, and I'm not having to worry about it, man, accept that. Can I also tell you this, and there's biblical evidence for you, and this is where we're going to close. There are times... When you and somebody else just don't mix, how many of you know what I'm talking about? You say, what's the best biblical example? David and Saul, the first king of Israel, and David, a man after God, God's own heart. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 24, verse 11. He says, this is David talking to Saul. And Saul is all, you know, all, Saul would be distressed, David would play music. 
Saul was hungry, David would feed him. The Philistines were a problem. Saul would send David to go kill the Philistines. I mean, that's all that happened. Remember Goliath, all of those things. David has done nothing to Saul. So here we are. Saul is trying to kill David again. Why? For no good reason. That's just who Saul is. Now let's journey on. He, and David says, I have not wronged you, but you are hunting me down to take my life. Here it is. David is being honest. Man, every time I turn around, Saul, whether I'll go kill the Philistines, come back, you'll want to throw a spear to me. Uh, you, you're distressed, I'll, I'll play an instrument for you just to, just to give you comfort. But as soon as you feel better, then you begin to attack me. So here it is. David says, I've not wronged you, but you are hunting me down to take my life. He says, may, here's what David says, may the Lord judge between you and me, and may the Lord avenge the wrongs you have done to me. But my hand, listen to this, will not touch you. What is he saying? He's going, man, I'm just going to separate out. Here we journey on verse 13. As the old saying goes, from evil doers come evil dudes, deeds, so my hands will not touch you. Here's what happened. You say, pastor, what happened after this? Did after this time when David spared Saul's life, did all of a sudden they become besties? Did they become buddies? Did they hang out? No. You know what happens pretty much from this point? On until the end of Saul's life, David and Saul just avoided each other. They just stayed away from each other. And sometimes I want us to understand that, that once you've done your best to reconcile a situation and be a peacemaker. Now, why did I go? Because it was more than just a one-time deal. Two, it was intentional. Three, it's a big deal. And four, it's not getting fixed unless I try to be a peacemaker. Once I've done that, if all of a sudden that person continues to be evil and unrepentant, then you do what David did, which was what? I'm just going to separate myself from you. I'm not constantly going to harm you. And no, go, go, to, go look, David doesn't go out of his way to make sure Saul gets hurt. But instead, David says, I'm going to be the man God called me to be. So as you journey forward today, how to have peace in your life, more than just the absence of conflict for a child of God, we're all, we're all going to have conflict all the time. If it's not one thing, it's going to be another. Starts with peace with God. Secondly, peace with my past. Thirdly, me being a peacemaker with others around me. And if we'll do that... I think we'll see what James, go look if you're going to have the app open, last verse. Those who are peacemakers, who sow in peace, that's where we want to be, will reap a harvest of righteousness. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for this day. God, thank you in this moment and season when, when things might be crazy and we might all be in conflict, that I can focus on really what it means to be at peace with my past, with my present, with my future, with my God, with my sins, and with others. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. God bless you.